Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening to those of you in the East. I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our 28th consecutive week of extraordinary programs presented by Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. We are thrilled tonight to welcome the very special David Axelrod and to welcome back the illustrious Pat Morrison for a conversation entitled, A Diminishing Presidency, What Lies Ahead? I welcome you on behalf of our leadership, Zev Yaroslavsky, Mel Levine, Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and David Lehrer, the leadership team of Jews United for Democracy and Justice. Thank you to our many wonderful co-sponsors, Temple Isaiah, Stephen Wise Temple, Valley Beth Shalom, Temple Beth Am, Leo Beck Temple, Ikar, Temple Israel of Hollywood, Jewish Center for Justice, and the Holocaust Museum LA. At the end of tonight's program, my partner and founder of Community Advocates will give you more details on our upcoming programs. You'll wanna stay and listen to it. We have some new things to report. Thank you for responding in such great numbers to our poll last week. We can report that only about half of our audience are Californians, while 20% come from the East Coast. The rest come from different, different parts around the United States. Uh, and we're very happy to have all of you with us tonight. You also overwhelmingly voted in favor of coming to programs throughout November and December, and 98% of you regularly vote. 85% of you are voting by mail this election or by official ballot box delivery. Hats off to all of you for being such conscientious Americans. Yesterday was the two year anniversary of the, murder, the murders at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. If we were together, we would join arms to say a memorial prayer for the 11 victims of that hateful shooting. I will just suggest that we take a few seconds to honor the memories of Rose Mallinger, Richard Gott Gottfried, Melvin Wax, Joyce Feinberg, Jerry Rabinowitz, Irving Younger, Daniel Stein, Cecil and David Rosenthal, and Sylvan and Bernice Simon. Mm -hmm. May their memories be a blessing which will help to lead us to better times where white supremacy and hate are conquered by love and tolerance. The 11 Jews killed at the Tree of Life Synagogue the nine African-Americans killed at the Emanuel African Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina, 49 mostly Latino gay men who died, in, who died at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. May the light of all of their memories help to unify this country and to guide us towards better, more peaceful times. Now to further introduce our speakers tonight, please welcome my friend, judge leadership team member and former Congressman Mel Levine. Janice, thank you very much. Um, I want to begin by saluting and thanking Janice and David Lair for their extraordinary leadership with regard to judge and uh, community advocates and all of these programs. Uh, Zev Yaroslavsky and I have the privilege of working with both of them regularly, and they are a joy to work with. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce David Axelrod who is a renowned political consultant, journalist, and analyst. Um, I only got to know David after uh, Barack Obama was elected president, uh, but I did have the privilege of working with him in the Obama re-election campaign, um, and, um, and I value that. Uh, David was the chief strategist for Barack Obama's presidential campaigns and served as, a, as senior advisor to President Obama in the White House. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago, had a distinguished career as a journalist at the Chicago Tribune, and he currently serves as the director of the nonpartisan University of Chicago Institute of Politics. Through that institute, uh, David founded the Axe Files, a series of podcasts available through CNN, where David is a senior political commentator. And along with his wife, Susan, David is deeply involved in CURE, Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy. Uh, David's memoir, Believer, My 40 Years in Politics, was a New York Times bestseller. And in David Gergen's review of the memoir, Gergen suggests that despite Obama's extraordinary talents, a strong case can be made that it was the partnership Obama formed with Axelrod and then the extraordinary campaign staff Axelrod assembled that propelled Obama to the White House. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing what David has to say, and he will be uh, interviewed by our terrific moderator, Pat Morrison, who is a, one, who is a multiple award-winning journalist, author, and radio television personality based in Los Angeles and Southern California. 
She has a share of two Pulitzer Prizes and her broadcasting work has won six Emmys and 12 Golden Mike Awards. Both of her nonfiction books have been bestsellers, Rio LA, her book about the LA River and Don't Stop the Presses. Pat has moderated many of the programs in this series and we are delighted to have her back again tonight. And I turn it over to Pat. Mel, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here a week before a very significant and possibly faith, fateful evening in American history and American politics. The image behind me is from Occidental College, which is where Barack Obama went to school here before going back to the East Coast. And I thought it would serve as a good image to convey the sense of the unity of the country, the possibilities of the presidency, and what has been happening with it. Because the title of this is a diminishing presidency, what lies ahead. Diminishing is never a term I would have associated with Donald Trump for his arrogance, his ambition, his cupidity, but how he has diminished the presidency, perhaps for himself and certainly for future generations if we don't do something about it, is what we'll be hearing about from David Axelrod tonight. All of the accolades that you heard and then some applied to this man who was the chief campaign strategist for the Barack Obama campaign, for both Barack Obama campaigns, successful, unlikely campaigns that delivered to us one of the most memorable and historic presidencies in our country. Um, so David, thank you very much for doing this, talking to us. Good to uh, be here, here. Pat. Thank you, to, um, thank you for having me and for those very kind words. Well, they're, they're well earned. Um, before we get to the nature of the Trump presidency and remediating the Trump presidency, can you do a little hand-holding for a couple of thousand <laughs> people who are, who are a week out and yeah. are still probably not getting a lot of sleep right now? I know. I, if, I, if I could charge for therapy, I would have made a fortune in the last few weeks. I can <laughs> we'll tell have you to that. get the group break from you. <laughs> but uh, look, let me be as explicit about this as I can. 2020 is not 2016. Uh, Donald Trump is not the plucky challenger. He is an embattled incumbent in the middle of a uh, national crisis that he has badly mishandled. Uh, his uh, approval rating sits in the low uh, 40s, where it's been for throughout his presidency. And um, the history of presidential politics is that presidents rarely get more, uh, much more in vote than they receive uh, in terms of their approval rating. Um, so uh, let's just start start there. Um, and uh, I say this as someone who admires uh, Secretary Clinton, but she was a she was a uh, freighted candidate at the end of that election, uh, and and also was uh, uh, you know confronted at the end with unfortunate uh, developments that made it harder for her. But she. Uh, was sitting there in the low 40s uh, in terms of the favorable rating that she had. Uh, Joe Biden is a much more popular challenger. Uh, and uh, so you have a much different situation here. And you can see it reflected in the polling, which I know everybody, you, you use the word polling and everybody has what I call PTSD, polling uh, traumatic uh, stress disorder. But the fact of the matter is that he has a much larger lead than Hillary Clinton did, both uh, nationally and in, in most of the states. And even where he's trailing in states that you'd expect him to lose, um, he is trailing by far less than she uh, lost those states. And that frankly, she was trailing in polling going into the election. Um, so there are a range of reasons. And I mean, I could go on for a while on this. Uh, I don't know how much reassurance people need, but, um, uh, and then just finally, let me say, um, a lot of us, and I include myself in this, uh, we overrode our, our guts on the, at the end of that last election because it was inconceivable to us that Donald Trump could get elected president. So even though the polls were quite close at the end nationally, uh, I think that there was about a two to three point margin, which is about what she won by uh, nationally. Uh, and even though some of the states were tight, um, and even though she seemed to be on the defensive and Trump was on the march, um, we, we dismissed the possibility that he could win. But it does matter what, how you finish. 
And the, the wheels are coming off of Donald Trump right now. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to watch some of these rallies. Um, but, you know, four years ago, he was, our, uh, he was speaking to other people's sense of grievance and, and resentment. Uh, now he's just disgorging his own grievances and resentment. Uh, and uh, he is in full denial of a virus that is spiking up. So the virus is, is, is exploding. The markets he so loves are falling uh, and he's out there doing burlesque, you know, and he, it's like his, his, uh, his campaign appearances are like the final uh, appearances of Lenny Bruce. I mean, he's mostly using them to complain about how he's been, how badly he's been treated. Lenny had a better case, but uh, so for all these reasons, and because I'm steeped in data that's all over my table here, uh, I feel uh, I feel very I feel very confident about what's going to happen in this election. Uh, people are wary of the polls because they feel they got burned last time because they looked so solid. But another thing that's different: Trump is no longer the shiny new object, as you point out. But he is the incumbent president. He has levers of power at his disposal, which he did not four years ago. How until up until election day? is he likely at all to use those levers? He's been trying to pressure departments of government to act on his behalf already. Yeah, he has. And, and, and some of them, at least of late, have resisted. Uh, you know, tomorrow, I'll give you an example of how he'll use it. Tomorrow, the GDP, new GDP numbers are gonna come out. They're gonna be, they're gonna be good because we had the single worst quarter in history last time. So there, there's been a, there'll have been something of a bounce back. We still won't recover what we've lost, but he will make it out to be the most astonishing uh, uh, economic uh, recovery ever. I don't think people, I think people who are inclined to support him will believe it. I think most people are living the reality of life in America today and won't, um, you know, uh, I don't, you know, there was a time when you thought there would be indictments and so on. That doesn't seem likely to happen in the next five days. You do worry about, you know, the, the process itself and how he might try and interpose himself. You know, he's encouraged people to go and, um, you know, my interpretation, not his words, but I think menace people at the polling places and so on. So we may see uh, some of that. Um, but um, time is running out, Pat. And, um, you know, there isn't an infinite bag of tricks for him. And I think, the, you know, now he looks like a guy who's frantically pressing all the buttons, hoping to get something, some sort of reaction. And, um, and he's not getting it. And he's not getting it because he seems to be unhinged and he's not connected to the main story that's, uh, that's on the minds of most Americans right now, which is uh, the virus. And that's particularly true in some of the states he absolutely needs to win. Uh, you know, uh, there was a Washington Post ABC poll today that, and this is one that I think overstates his, uh, his the situation, but that had him winning by 17 points in Wisconsin. I don't think he's winning by 17 points, but I think the margin has grown because the state is in a, in a state of emergency uh, because of this virus. Biden, not Trump. Trump has a 17 point lead there. Yes. Oh. No, 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 no. I'm saying Biden has a 17 point lead on Thank Trump. You. Sorry. No, okay. no, no. There are a lot of people calling the paramedics right now. Stop. Yeah, no, I, I, I apologize. I, I got to be careful here. I know everybody's <laughs> fragile. Uh, but um, but uh, there, are, there are multiple polls that suggest that the lead may be widening out some in Wisconsin. Um, you know, Michigan seems solid. Pennsylvania a little closer, but uh, but still, you know, a lead outside the polling margin of error. Just this one point on the polls, I want to repeat again, the national polls were correct in 2016. They were correct. They said Hillary Clinton would win by, I think by the end, they said about three points, she won by 2.2. That's very close. National polls were right. Some of the state polls were wrong, uh, but uh, I think there's been a lot, there, there've been a lot of work done on these polls. And some of the private polls are more reliable than public polls because more money is invested in, in the technology yeah. and the methodology. So, you know, what can I tell you? I, I, think, I think that this thing is in a good place for Joe Biden. And he may, if, if there is a surprise on Tuesday, I think he will surprise on the high side, not 
uh, rather than Trump uh, w winning 270 electoral votes. Now, the, the, the scenario, the ideal scenario people have talked about is that the Biden win is so decisive that there's virtually no room for complaints about voter fraud and that sort of thing. It doesn't mean that Trump isn't going to There's try. always room for complaints for Trump. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but on election day and on election day eve and even into that night, you know, we've already seen the, uh, the uh, fiddling with the post office, the mechanisms and the Secretary of State of Michigan saying today, don't mail your ballots. It may be too late to mail your ballots, take them in person. What could happen on election day? Could Trump mobilize any kind of people in uniform out to the polls, apart from the militias that you may think he's summoning, can he create scenarios that allow him to step in and intervene? Yeah, I, I find that highly improbable. Uh, I understand I understand people's concerns because he is unbounded, uh, but he would need the cooperation of others, and I don't think he will he will get that cooperation. I should have pointed out, Pat, in my little summary, uh, probably buried the lead. Uh, 75 million people have voted already. Uh, and by uh, if you look at both uh, where these votes are coming from in terms of voter ID and uh, polling, it's very clear Joe Biden is mounting up a big lead uh, here. And uh, 75 million, just to put in perspective, is more than half of what the voter turnout in the entire election of 2016. Um, so very likely Biden's going to go into election day with a really substantial lead. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the, where it becomes complicated is uh, that means that um, because many Democrats are voting by mail and voting early, uh, responding to public health experts and others who suggest this is the responsible thing to do, um, and Trump's voters are disproportionately going to vote on election day. There are states where the absentee or write-in ballot or, or mail-in ballots aren't counted until uh, after election day, or they don't begin counting until election day. And so the count goes on. You in California are well familiar with this. Um, so it, you could have a situation in, a, in, in, a, in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, where the early raw count looks favorable to Trump. Uh, he might even, on the basis of it, go out and suggest that he's going to win the election. Well, and then in every subsequent day when the votes are counted and that vote, those votes fill in, you know, he may contend that, you know, this is being stolen from him. I mean, I think that is the, that's probably the worst case scenario there. Well, is that why then we heard Brett Kavanaugh in an opinion from the Supreme Court suggest that voting should stop at midnight on election day, which of course contravenes the laws in virtually every state in this country. In California, you have 17 days. I think in Kentucky, you have 25 days to count the votes. And Trump himself picked this up on the campaign trail that if you stop counting on election night, that's going to be the election. Don't count all that other stuff, it won't matter. Yeah, no, and I think that he is, uh, he's accelerating his rhetoric in that regard as the reality of his situation becomes clear. Now, that was chilling uh, when Justice Kavanaugh uh, offered that uh, uh, opinion as part of this emergency uh, order, uh, and he was roundly rebuked by Justice Kagan uh, for it because uh, he said that these, uh, this could be seen as an effort to flip the result. And uh, Kagan properly said, there's no result to flip until all the votes are counted. And, um, but, you know, I don't know how much to read into that, but here's the thing. If the, these things can all come into play if the margins are close enough uh, and there are enough disputes uh, to, uh, uh, in, in a close, in a close election. I, I think that, uh, the thing to watch on election night are the states that actually count their ballots on election day. Florida, for example, counts its mail-in uh, and early vote uh, on election day. You, the first number you'll probably see in Florida will be reflecting that vote, and it'll probably show Joe Biden with a, a substantial lead that will decline as the election day totals come in. But if Joe Biden wins Florida, 
uh, it, you know, it's almost immaterial what happens after that because it's inconceivable that Trump could put the 270 electoral votes together uh, without winning the state of Florida. And you know, I just point out that nobody, no Republican since Calvin Coolidge has done that. Uh, so we would know. And there are other states like that. Uh, Arizona is another state uh, that you can watch, uh, uh, fill in most of the results in real time. And so I think the, you know, North Carolina, to some degree, Ohio, there are states that Trump has to have. And if he doesn't, uh, we know what the result is. And it'll take the mystery out of those three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Uh, and that would probably be a good thing. John F. Kennedy didn't know until the morning after the election that he had become president, and so how we have changed our expectations. But those of us who are old enough to be cursed with the memory remember Florida 2000, yes. remember the Brooks Brothers mob that insisted that the voting stop in Florida. And my worst case scenario is always that the, the we will have Brooks Brothers mobs and that kind of scenario in multiple swing states as these things look as close as you describe. And I just, I, I can't imagine as bad as 2000 was going into December until it was final and the concession by Gore, how this will play out with both angry, sometimes armed supporters and squads of lawyers now on each side. Yeah. And, and there's no doubt that there are battalions of lawyers being mobilized. I, I first of all, Actually, I didn't say that I thought it would be uh, close. I, I don't think, I think that there will be more of a margin in, um, in, in some of these states than, um, uh, than perhaps people expect. But um, like I said, uh, you know, the Florida vote, let's just remember, history will record whatever people believe. I mean, uh, history will record that Bush won that state by 527 votes. I don't think this is this race in Florida is going to be determined by 527 votes. I think um, someone's going to have a, a much larger margin than that. And um, so I, I, you know, but look, I, I'm not. Donald Trump is is Donald Trump, and um, you know he will resist. And look, even if his even if his notion isn't to try and uh, wrench the presidency uh, away uh, through nefarious means. I think that uh, there are only two outcomes that his, his, uh, his ego will allow. One is that he lost, one is that he won, and the other is that it was stolen from him. And he still doesn't accept that he lost the popular vote in 2016 by 3 million votes. And he impaneled a whole commission uh, to find them headed by a, a friendly Secretary Kobach from Kansas. And these, uh, these sleuths could not find, uh, you know, any significant evidence of vote fraud or manipulation. So this is not a new story for Donald Trump. And I do think that there is a, at some point, um, you know, there, uh, people will, uh, even, even some people in his own party are going to say it's time to move on. Well, that was my question. Are, will there be a Hugh Scott, Barry Goldwater delegation to the White House if the election results are so clear that will say, leave it alone. We're not going to back you anymore. Just stand down when the time comes. Yeah, well, the difference is I think if Hugh Scott and Barry Goldwater showed up and Donald Trump was the president, he'd send them on their way with nasty tweets. Um, you know, one of the things that's different from, I think about it often, uh, that era is uh, Fox News, social media. We're speaking and, of the Watergate era for our younger audience. Yeah, yes. And, uh, and I wonder, I often wonder if Nixon would have actually resigned if he had the resources that Trump has, uh, the, the social, social media, Fox News, and the whole right-wing infrastructure. Um, I don't think he's going to respond to what... Um, uh, what anybody tells him, but I, I do think that um, the the machinery of government will move on if it's clear that he if it's clear that he lost, and I think it it, it will be. I'll I'll ask you more about the machinery and the mechanics in a minute, but if Trump loses, it seems that he will be at his most dangerous between election day and inauguration day. 
what do you expect? And of course, Barack Obama famously said, there's only one president at a time. Yeah. What can Congress, what can Democrats do, or even Republicans, if they will, to mitigate some of the damage that he's likely to do? I, I, I listen, with pardoning. Yeah, well, pardoning and firings. Uh, you know, there was some reporting this week, and I actually had on my John Bolton on my podcast, and he said he, he was less concerned about what Trump was going to do between now and the election than what he would do between the election and the inauguration. And he predicted what has been reported on this week now, uh, that Trump will purge everyone who he feels has been uh, uncooperative uh, or unsupportive of him. So Christopher Wray, uh, Gina Haspel, the FBI director, the CIA uh, director, Dr. Fauci, um, you know, so I think that's one thing that could happen. It's just a settling of scores all across the government and including people who are, you know, essential. Uh, you know, I don't think I need to remind anybody here why Dr. Fauci is so important at this particular moment. So there's that. There's, there's, uh, uh, there is pardoning. There, is, there are deals, uh, uh, I, you know, although there may be, some uh, need to intervene on the part of Congress and so on. But, you know, his dealings with foreign governments um, is concerning uh, uh, to me in that period. It's also concerning to me what foreign government governments think they can get away with in that period of time. And, you know, he, his relationships are strong, but not with our allies, but with our adversaries. That is a, that is a concern. Uh, so, look, I, I think this is a real issue and it's a real test, I think, for the Republican Party um, as to whether they're going to lock arms uh, with, with Democrats and with uh, career people and uh, prevent the worst from happening. But I think it's going to be a rough period. And I, you know what I regret, Pat, is um, when, when, when we won, no one would say that we were gentle on George W. Bush during our campaign, though he wasn't on the ballot. We were very critical of his administration. During the period between the election and the inauguration, he and his staff could not have been more uh, cooperative with us, more encouraging, more friendly. Um, each of us were called over to the White House by our, uh, by our counterparts. President hosted a lunch with all the former presidents for President Obama. There were certain things that we asked him to do that he did uh, uh, to help ease the transition. Uh, there were some, crit we were in the middle of multiple crises at the time. And, uh, and, and he was personally encouraging to all of us. And I never, you know, I knew he, he wasn't doing that because he loved what we said or necessarily agreed with what we were gonna do. He did it because he felt it was his responsibility as a trustee of the democracy. Uh, and he thought this was a sacred res responsibility. Um, and it, it's important in the absence of that and to have a president who is likely to be obstructive uh, at a time of national emergency is, uh, is really concerning. Um, if Joe Biden wins, the Oval Office will have to be kind of emergency room for triage. And we hear so much from presidents about on day one, this and that and the other. So what, what are those day one priorities? Is it COVID? Is it starting the process of shoring up these institutions of democracy to protect them because all along we've had what we considered a kind of gentleman's agreement that everyone would abide by the rules. And we see what happens when we have someone who's not a gentleman who will not abide by Yes. The rules. So where, where does a new administration's energy go? How do you apportion it? You know, first of all, you make such an important point because we, have all, we all take our democracy for granted. I think too much so, hopefully less so now. Uh, but what we've learned is it really does rely on the goodwill uh, and the uh, adherence to rules and laws and norms and an appreciation for institutions on the part of the person who sits in that office and the people who uh, that person brings to government. And um, uh, so uh, I think one of the things that Biden 
brings is a reverence for these institutions and an appreciation for these institutions and familiarity with it. But look, he's going to walk in. I used to say we, the Obama team and President Obama were handed the worst was a set of circumstances of anyone since Franklin Roosevelt. And that record hasn't even lasted 10 years uh, because Joe Biden will face a more difficult uh, set of circumstances. It's pretty clear that uh, we are not going to be, uh, we're not going to be ra- uh, rounding the corner on this virus by January 20th. Uh, and uh, the, the fallout is going to be dramatic and the process of mobilizing the nation uh, is going to be uh, critical. And that has to be job number one. And that includes, we'll see if the Congress enacts some sort of fiscal or some sort of stimulus uh, between now and then. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I would hope that that would be the case. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, inconsistent with what I saw during those eight years of Senator McConnell decided that he was going to let President Biden, hand, uh, you know, worry about the stimulus and uh, uh, rather than uh, bail bail him out. So, um, so he, he may have to deal with fiscal f- with stimulus uh, that was neglected for months and months and months on day one. I think he's going to want to move on his economic program generally very quickly because the economy is going to need not just the stimulus but uh, some of the long-term effects uh, of his economic uh, program. And then, you know, we don't know what the court's going to do uh, relative to health care, uh, but whether they, uh, whether they zero out the Affordable Care Act or not, he's made clear he wants to strengthen it. That's yeah. part of that. Pro- so I think so- that's, that's plenty right there. But to your other question, I think through the people he appoints to these key positions, he's going to begin to send a signal Um, and just to make everybody not nervous, uh, if he's elected, uh, he is going to, the people he will bring will be, I think, uh, designed to, to, to restore trust in these institutions that have been so frayed, uh, by this president. And then there's something you didn't mention, which is our, you know, our alliances in the world, which have been terribly damaged. And, you know, the world is waiting for a signal that America is America again. And um, I think he's going to want to send that as well. A lot of that he can do unilaterally as president. But there, there's discussion about the possibility of the Democrats taking, flipping the Senate. Even so, there's also discussion about what happens to the Republican Party when Trump is gone. Trumpism will still be out there. But once re- Republicans no longer have to fear the dreaded Trump tweet, will they be more inclined to mend fences, to go along with programs and to cooperate and try to get back to a normal sense of operations, which they have not had since uh, 2016. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is unclear. And you're, it's an important point to mention because, um, yeah, Biden needs to win. If Biden wins, he needs to bring a Democratic Senate with him. Uh, we saw six years of what it was like to be a Democratic president with a Republican uh, uh, Senate, Republican Congress as well, but um, and just the inability to do the things that needed to be uh, done to the degree uh, that that the president wanted to, uh, and in the middle of this crisis, he you know he can't um, he he can't be throttled in the way that uh, Obama was after his first two years. Um, and that brings up the question of the filibuster, which is something I think he's going to have to confront. Uh, if, uh, and, and for Joe Biden, who is an institutionalist, that's not an easy question, but I, I think the success of his presidency is going to rest on either the Republicans laying down their swords and not filibustering key elements of his program, or a Democratic Senate, if he wins one, uh, uh, doing away with the filibuster. As to the idea of a diminishing presidency, I think most people would think the last four years have done anything but diminish at least Donald Trump and and Bob Barr's notion of a unitary presidency, the claiming of privilege for acts that Trump committed years before he even became yes. president. Um, this, this has had a sense of enlargement that makes the Nixon imperial presidency look petty by comparison. So 
by the presidency, we're talking about how he has damaged the institution, I presume, and therefore how you make it something of value and valor and standing at home and internationally again. Oh, I think that's really important. Um, and again, you know, I think, um, you know, whatever Biden's strengths and, and limitations are, I think one of his very greatest strengths is his reverence for the institution of the presidency and the institutions of our democracy. And I think, you know, it's interesting because you, you know, you, you do need to uh, use the powers of the presidency uh, in, 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 in really uh, emphatic ways to try and deal with some of the problems that we face, but it also requires uh, the humility of knowing where the limits are. And, uh, but the thing I think people will be clear about uh, is that whatever Biden's doing, he will be doing it because he thinks that it is the best policy for the country and not because it is uh, uh, for the furtherance of his particular pecuniary interests or the, uh, you know, the accumulation of his personal power uh, for his personal aggrandizement. And that will be a big change uh, here. The one thing I feel confident about is there will be a different feel and a different vibe uh, in the White House if Biden wins and that there will be a restoration of a sense of integrity and honesty and uh, service in the public interest. And that alone would be a great accomplishment. The country desperately needs that now just to re a, a rejuvenation uh, of the institutions of our democracy, including a presidency that is responsive to problems, uh, but, is, but also understands its limitation. Uh, Donald Trump has much hated the bureaucracy that has been in place as non-political, um, non-partisan for decades, and he doesn't believe that. He has dispatched scientists from Washington, D.C. to the middle of the country and expected them to do their job. Uh, people have decided to leave their jobs because of the persecution, the possibility of getting singled out by a tweet. People have decided not to go into these services, like the civil services. That damage has gone on. It, it will last more than four years. And that, too, is something that's going to need addressing. Yeah, well, it's not just that I know you're talking about the climate scientists that were d dispatched to the middle of the country. But we're having scientists dispatched right now from discharging their responsibilities relative to uh, a pandemic, or the likes of which we haven't seen in a hundred years. And and and, and, and Pat, people undone by a sharpie, a line with a sharpie on a map. On the hurricanes, yeah. The yeah, absolutely. But um, the thing that's happened is that um, the country has seen as is feeling the consequences of that. You know, I, I think I'm not sure that Trump would have won in any case, but what the virus has done was, you know, all these idiosyncrasies that some were willing to forgive him for, the cost of them is now clear. The cost of ignoring science, the cost of subjugating everything to your own personal political interests, all of this has been on display in this battle with the virus. And now we have, uh, you know, we're closing in on 230,000 casualties and many, many more lives uh, ruined uh, by this virus with no end in sight, even though the White House proclaimed today the, the end of the virus was uh, one of Trump's first term accomplishments. Um, they then corrected that. They said that was misstated. We meant to say the goal of ending the, the virus. But, but the American people have gotten a lesson in this. And it's really interesting to me. I, I think that uh, one thing Donald Trump, Trump has done, I don't think it was his intent, is I think he has reminded people uh, why a competent, responsive government is actually necessary. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Joe Biden can build on that uh, and will build on that, uh, assuming that he's elected next Tuesday. Let me ask questions that some of the, wow, more than 3,000 people who are watching have to put to you. And Here's one from Alan, which gets asked in many ways about a truth commission. It's worth remembering, as people do not, in Watergate, we put a former attorney general in prison. We put a former White House chief of staff in prison. This would not be unprecedented, but is it the right thing to do? Listen, I think this is a very, very difficult question. And I, I, I imagine that when I say what I'm going to say, 
I don't, you get 3,000 people on, I probably, uh, I would guess 2,500 may hit exit. But um, uh, I think that if I'm a president by knowing what I have to deal with and knowing that one of my goals is to try and heal this country, uh, I don't think my first order of business would be to look back. I would be looking forward. Uh, and there will be a lot of uh, hunger to try and um, uh, hold accountable uh, those who've been involved in my, uh, some of the horrific shenanigans that we've seen. Um, but, uh, and, and not the least of which is the president. Remember, you, you talk about Watergate. Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. He pardoned him. And it, it probably cost him the presidency. And he knew that it was going to cost him the presidency. And, you know, I honor him for that uh, because he didn't. And I don't believe he did it as part of a deal with Richard Nixon. I think he did it because he thought it would rip the country apart and he wanted to get past that. I think there's an example uh in that we do have to survey the damage that's been done so you can repair it. And it may be that you wanna take a selective look at what's happened in the last four years to try and strengthen the safeguards against it happening again. Uh, but what it shouldn't be is, uh, it, it shouldn't be, even if it's righteous vengeance, um, uh, you know, I don't think that's the way to heal the country. Now, when, one thing I would add though, um, that does not mean that if the Trump organization has legal problems in the state of New York because of the way they've run their businesses, um, that is, that's to me is in a different category. Uh, but I'm talking about actions initiated by the next administration. I'd be very thoughtful about it. And, and the corollary of that is whether you think that Trump would just issue pardons for himself preemptively everybody in his circle uh, as as he leaves office. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be stunned. I think the pardon truck is going to back up on November 4th here. I, I don't think I don't think there's any question. And the only issue is can he pardon himself? There's been some legal dispute as to whether I, you know, the president's pardon powers is unlimited, but there have been some opinions as to whether, uh, you know, that that cast out on whether he could actually pardon uh, himself. So uh, but I expect that, you know, a bunch of the players, uh, Flynn and Manafort and others, uh, and maybe, you know, prophylactically, some other people uh, could be pardoned uh, as he was. And you know what he will say, I, you know what he'll say, he'll say, uh, I expect that there'll be uh, corrupt prosecutions when, and I'm going to make sure that people who serve their country should not be punished for having served their country. I can, you can write the script. Um, a question from Len about whether the liberal progressive slash socialist, whatever you want to call it, and you probably have a much better phrase for it than anybody else, that wing of the Democratic Party is going to pose problems for a Biden agenda. You know, there will be, there, there's no doubt there's going to be a vigorous debate. We had a vigorous debate when Barack Obama got elected. And, you know, there were those who said, for example, that we that he shouldn't sign the Affordable Care Act unless it included a public option, which we could not pass through the Congress. Um, and um, so we had a choice as to whether or not we should uh, pass the Affordable Care Act and get health coverage for tens of millions of Americans and people with pre-existing condition and, and do away with lifetime caps and all the things that the Affordable Care Act did or that we should uh, uh, refuse. And, and just uh, say, if we can't get the public option, then we'll take nothing. Um, that would have been a tragedy in my view, uh, but we'll have those kinds of fights. I don't doubt that Biden, look, you look at his program. I, I've been reading a lot about it lately because I'm doing a lot of speaking and particularly in economic forums where they ask about it. Uh, you know, when Bernie Sanders said, if he passes his program, he'll be the most uh, progressive president since Roosevelt. I don't know how I don't know that that's hyperbole. It may not be satisfying enough to uh, to to people uh, on the left, but it would be really important progress. And I just would point out that you know the growth in the Democratic Party. There there are some there are some great figures on the left. I'm a big admirer of AOC, who I think is um, 
is a really talented, uh, you know, really one of the most talented young uh, leaders that I've seen and one of a great natural communicator. Um, but the growth in the Democratic Party has largely taken place in suburban areas around the country, suburban areas that, by the way, are going to provide the margin of victory for Biden, I believe, on Tuesday. You and the I've, suburbs where Donald Trump will be putting the husbands back to work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Another, another sterling example of how not to finish a campaign. Um, but, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the bulk of the new members in 2018 came from these areas. They are center left, you know, and, um, and, and I think that the, the, to, the, in the main, the people who are going to be added, and I think Democrats will gain 10 to 12 seats in this election, are also going to come from these suburban areas. There is a growing sort of center left block in the Congress. The new senators, uh, if, if they come, the Kellys, the Hickenloopers, uh, they, these are not, these are not, these are center left politicians. And so, uh, yes, I think there'll be, and there should be, I think progressives should push uh, Biden, uh, but I don't think that in the end of the day, uh, that they, they should stand in the way of what will, would be substantial uh, Progress. I mean, adding a public option to the to the healthcare plan, lowering the age to which you can, where people can get join Medicare, buy into Medicare, uh, those kinds of things uh, are not uh, are not uh, small achievements. And uh, if if you can get them, um, you should take them. And uh, I, I I hope uh, I hope that they will, and I expect that they will. And I think Biden should do what Biden feels is right. Uh, and last point on this, Pat, I'm sorry. I think the country has moved. The country, you know, things that seemed r sort of radical in the past and, and the public option may be one of them. Uh, uh, you know, substantial action on climate, uh, you know, uh, genuine and meaningful help on childcare, uh, th these kinds of things that you know, maybe Donald Trump, Trump calls them socialist, but a majority of people in this country call them good ideas. And right. so I think the country has moved because the problems have uh, changed and, and have, have emerged in more stark relief. But, and I but, think that's gonna make it easier for Biden to, to get his program passed. Even so, the courts have been pulling in the opposite direction with, the, and especially you see at the top with the Trump appointees on the Supreme Court, going backwards on Roe versus Wade, perhaps undone. Yes, I expect it'll be undone. Issues, voting rights, you know, that, that John Roberts um, damaged in a lot of ways and gun issues too. So here you have two bodies, you, well, you may have Congress and the presidency in conflict, substantial conflict with the judiciary over this. And there's some question about even revisiting the primacy of the judiciary and its power and what Congress can do to choose to limit it all the way back to Marbury versus Madison, which is another gentleman's agreement not enshrined in law. Right. Uh, and there'll be pressure to do that. And there's already pressure based on what happened with Merrick Garland and now the, uh, the, the Senate's own version of Operation Warp Speed, the, the confirmation of Justice Barrett. There, there is a lot of pressure uh, to, tr to uh, expand the court and take other steps. Um, my guess is that um, that he, he said he's gonna appoint a commission to report back in 180 days on judicial reform. Um, I think that will buy him some time. I don't think that you wanna embark on that fight at the, the moment you arrive because you have so much else uh, to deal with. And I think much as, I think that if the filibuster goes, it's gonna go when when the uh, Senate proves that it won't uh, uh, give a fair hearing to uh, uh, to uh, to Biden's uh, program, even if majority support it, uh, I think if the you know if for example the court throws out the Affordable Care Act, I think they will do away with Roe versus Wade. They take a series of steps that are so far out of the main mainstream. Uh, I think that pressure will grow. Uh, and I think you will see an expansion of lower courts, additional judges and so on. Uh, you know, the, the legacy of Donald Trump, uh, other than the squalid 
uh, kinds of schemes that he was involved in as president uh, is going to be uh, the judiciary and you know th the three nominees that he put on the United States Supreme Court who have pulled it far to the right uh, and is the most conservative court since the, the 1930s. If we've been talking about a Biden presidency, if Trump has another four years, what will the country look like and what what will Democrats have to do? One of our um, viewers said, why, uh, Jim, Democrats so timid. How are, how are Democrats going to be able to make common cause with some Republicans like Lincoln Project Republicans and, and stop the, the, you know, the, the American carnage, the phrase Trump used in his inaugural yeah. speech, but we've been seeing American carnage by the American government here. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I hear this a lot, this timidity thing, as if one can stamp one's feet and stop things from happening. Uh, you know, the Congress impeached the president of the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, they, they, they used some of the tools that were available to them. They, uh, you know, they were thwarted in some of their oversight. And this is a judicial issue. Uh, because he simply uh, chose not to ignore, he, cho he simply chose to ignore their oversight responsibility. Uh, and look, these are, uh, these are big problems. And uh, I, I think they should use every device at their disposal, every legal device at their disposal to hold him accountable. But I do, look, I'm not, a four, another four years of Donald Trump, uh, you know, unrestrained by the need to run for re-election uh, and affirmed by re-election, uh, I think uh, is going to be an ordeal from which the country will have a hard time recovering and for, uh, from which our, in our democratic institutions uh, will not emerge uh, as we know them today. It's a very sobering thought. Uh, and I do think that uh, those institutions and our fundamental values as a democracy are very much on the ballot right now. And uh, so for the last minute or so, if you would like to give some parting thoughts for people to take with them, maybe comforting ones, maybe unsettling ones, maybe this should be accompanied with instructions about how to open a bottle of wine. <laughs> I suspect everybody has practiced that quite a bit lately. <laughs> Um, let me just say um, that uh, I, I love this country. I'm the son of an immigrant. I love it because uh, there are these mag majestic days when we get to grab the wheel of history and turn it in the direction that we think is right. Uh, I just talked about the things that are on the ballot. This is not an ordinary election. And uh, I am I'm inspired by the, 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 you know, these people who have been standing on line for nine hours to vote, whether that's appropriate or not, they should have to wait for nine hours. But Americans are speaking and they are using their voice and they're using their agency and they are grabbing the wheel of history. And um, I know that people are fearful, but I also think people should be inspired and hopeful uh, by how engaged the American people are right now, even in the midst of a pandemic. And I just have faith in, in, in the American people uh, to uh, choose the right path. Uh, and I, I think you should have faith in them as well, until further notice. It, and is there, is that the upside to four years of Donald Trump, that, um, that we all realize what it means when you say our lives, our fortune and our sacred honor being pledged to something to make it better, to make it um, workable for all. I, I very much think so. I very much think so. I think that we've gotten a lesson in the fact that we can't take democracy for granted and that we all have a role to play. Uh, and uh, the fact that so many people are stepping up now says to me that people have divined that from them. So yes, it's a painful way to learn that lesson, but uh, we know now what we can't take for granted and that is an important gift in a way, uh, but we have to act on it on Tuesday. I am sure we'll be seeing and hearing more of David Axelrod as these days unfurl the week ahead and the weeks afterwards. And 
always grateful for the council and the insight. David Axelrod, thank you again. Pat, good to be with you and, and everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And let's go back then to, uh, to David Lehrer of Community Advocates with a message about the organization and the kind of programs you've just been watching, David. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, David. What an absolutely magnificent discussion for six days before the election. I think everyone learned a lot and gained some insights that we didn't have before. A reminder, we'll have a terrific program this Sunday evening, November 1st at five o'clock, Sunday, not next Wednesday. We'll have political practitioners, pundits, and academics all assessing what will happen next Tuesday and what it means. Bob Schramm, a longtime Democratic consultant, historic speechwriter, and now a professor at USC, will be joined by USC colleague Mike Madrid, a political consultant and co-founder of the now notorious Lincoln Project. Also on the panel will be two nationally recognized pundits, both at the Washington Post and both making return visits to our program, Max Boot, who was on last week, and Jennifer Rubin. Also with us will be an expert on elections in their meeting. She's a professor at UCLA, Lynn Vavrick. Lynn has written two of the definitive works on the 2012 and 2016 presidential campaigns. And finally, veteran pollster Paul Maslin, who has helped elect senators, Doug Jones, Kristen Sinema, Harry Reid, Tammy Baldwin, among many others. That'll be quite an array of political brain power looking to tell us what will be two days later. We hope that you will continue to have us on your calendar for every Wednesday evening after Sunday, except for November 4th. Resuming our programs on November 11th will be with, will, with Bill Crystal, editor-at-large of The Bulwark, followed by Ron Brownstein on the 18th. George Will will return on Thanksgiving Eve and Adam Schiff the following week. Thank you for spending the evening with us. We'll see you Sunday. Stay healthy and stay safe.